Hello, and welcome to a live episode of Pop Culture on Deprogram with Carrie Smith. I am one of your hosts, Carrie. I'm here with Mr. Chris. Hello, Mr. Chris. How are you? I'm hanging in there. How are you doing, Carrie? I'm good. We have, um, uh, I've moved upstairs, you may say, why is Carrie in the dark? Uh, because we are finally renovating the studio room, which I'm so excited about. And just want to say thank you again to all of our subscribers. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very grateful. We are, um, we were, my husband and I have a list of the rooms in this old house that we're renovating and the studio room was pretty far down the list and now we've moved it up. Um, and, uh, we've been working down, he and our friend, uh, David were working down there today. And so <clears throat> had to move everything out and I'm in the upstairs of our haunted house. So that's what's <laughs> going on here. <laughs> Um, I, I do have two quick announcements. Um, last night I was on Chrissy Mayer's show. If you guys are fans of Chrissy, that was a great time if you want to go check it out. And also, uh, I've mentioned it before, but this week, uh, the Jubilee episode that I was in came out. Jubilee has its YouTube channel. They have a series called Middle Ground. And the episode I was on was called Former Conservatives versus Former Liberals. And you can check it out on their channel. And it was it was actually really encouraging, I think, to see people who, like a lot of the comments said, wow, this is the, the most civil conversation that they've ever had on Middle Ground. Um, so it, it was, it's encouraging. I think you should watch it because we found, we did find actually a lot of Middle Ground. Um, and one other, so I had three announcements. One other is this Friday, at my regular coffee break time at one o'clock, I'm going to be airing an interview with this amazing woman here in Texas. Her name is Hannah Frankman. She is the founder of Rebel Educator, and she's sort of an out of the box thinker and helps helps parents figure out how to navigate their child's education and has this whole organization with people there to help if you're trying to decide between private school, homeschool, public school. And she was just fabulous. It's so cool talking to her. So I'll be around in the chat. That's going to be Friday at one o'clock. But I definitely recommend it, especially for parents that you um, listen to what, what Hannah has to say. So, so that's going to be Friday. I think that's it. <clears throat> so do you want to do you want to tell people a little bit about tonight's episode? Because I know you're happy we're not doing Halloween themes anymore. Or no true crime, anyway. <laughs> I like doing those episodes. It's just that it's time. And so, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, tonight we're doing the blending of politics and entertainment. And this is inspired by Neil Postman's book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, which if you have never read that book, I think you should. It's a great book that talks about the medium of television, how that's contribute to the destruction and downfall of political discourse. And so I thought we could talk a little bit about specific examples from politics and how uh, the marketing specifically of politicians and the way the news coverage treats political news and other news has contributed to people becoming more dumber when it comes to discussing uh, topics and news items that are rather complicated. I, I haven't read Amusing Ourselves to Death yet. I, I want to read that one. Does it tie it back to like the one of the acceleration points or turning points where politics became more like entertainment? Does it tie it back to the invention of television? Uh, he goes back further, actually. He, oh. he, his uh, hypothesis ties it back to the invention of the uh, telegraph. And uh, he says that because um, in, prior to the invention of that piece of technology, news had to travel via train or horseback, which meant that only the most important news would travel. Because if somebody in Texas, um, they're not going to know what's going on and say, you know, Maine or something, some other part of the country. But if it's important to them, then people will bring that news to them. And then people in Texas will be informed about what's going on. Once the telegraph was invented, news could be transmitted instantaneously. Therefore, it increased the appetite of people to consume more trivial news, news that didn't really have an impact on them or very little impact on them. And that kind of set the stage for 
eventually television coming out and then doing the same thing, but to a higher degree where you have all these bits of information that are presented completely out of contact, uh, historical content text, and uh, that are given to people just one piece of news after another, not allowing people to really digest what they just heard because they're just moving on to next news story, next news story. It's just consume, yes. consume, consume. And it's almost like <laughs> TikTok, even though I know TikTok isn't a news outlet or news service, but it's just all these short little videos that people just consume. They have such short attention spans that just consume, move on. And a lot of times people don't even remember that much of what they consume because it's just rapid fire. Yes. I So I do have an excerpt from the book that gets to the point you're making. And I wonder if I could just put this up here. I think most of our audience will be familiar <clears throat> with both of the books mentioned here. Um, so he says, this, this is a, an excerpt from uh, Amusing Ourselves to Death. And he's talking about the two dystopian novels, 1984 by George Orwell and uh, A Brave New World by uh, Huxley. So he says, what Orwell feared were those who would ban books. What Huxley feared was that there would be no reason to ban a book for there would be no one who wanted to read one. And so he's sort of, arguing that we're more in like the Huxley dystopia. He says, Orwell feared those who would deprive us of information. Huxley feared those who would give us so much information that we would be reduced to passivity and egoism. Orwell feared that the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. Orwell feared we would become a captive culture Huxley feared we would become a trivial culture, preoccupied with some equivalent of the feelies, the orgy porgy, and the centrifugal bumble bu bu puppy. <laughs> As Huxley remarked in Brave New World Revisited, the civil libertarians and rationalists who are ever on the alert to oppose tyranny, quote, failed to take into account man's almost infinite appetite for distractions, end quote. In 1984, Orwell added, people are controlled by inflicting pain. In Brave New World, they are controlled by inflicting pleasure. In short, Orwell feared that what we fear will ruin us, but Huxley feared that what we desire will ruin us. That's such a great passage. And this book was written in the 1980s. Keep that in mind. And I think it's still apt to today, everything going on. Because I, I, I still think we are closer to Huxley than we are Orwell. Things are becoming more Orwellian. As it's a little of both. About. But I, I still think a, a great deal of people are largely uninterested in the um, deeper conversations and exploring uh, certain events, the historical contents. As, you know, he talks about how a lot of people just don't care. Because it, it's amazing to me how many people I meet who just don't care about history. And I always tell people, like, understanding history is understanding yourself because you have been affected by the culture. We all have. And so if you can understand the culture and the politics and everything that's influenced it, then you can better understand yourself and some of the decisions that you've made because of these cultural and political influences. Is the rest of the book this, um, this great, like this much of a pleasure to read? Yeah, it's a short book, too. So, because uh, I, I read it 10 years ago and then recently for the show, I listened to the audio book and the audio book was only like four hours. Wow. Okay. That's good to know. Um, thank you, Lindsay Garrett, one of our YouTube members uh, for five months. She says, hello, I'm glad to catch a live chat again. Well, we are glad you're here. We took last week off because we had, um, I had the, that Christian panel. And so I'm so happy Mystery Chris is back. Peter Lim says, yay, Carrie and Chris are back. <laughs> yay. Yay, thank you. Okay, before we move on, I did have one other just quick thing. Um, we do have a new uh, complaint line for any leftists who would like to complain. You can see the number there at the bottom of the screen. Just call 1-719-266-2837. And select from the possible choices uh, if you would like to make a complaint. We'll just leave it there for a second so everybody's got that number. 
<laughs> That's real, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you should call it. Ah, yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, I'm going to give you a spoiler, but don't tell the people who want to complain. It's it's actually it's the call and oats number. It's for all of your hollow notes emergencies. So <laughs> if, you, if you call it, they have a selection you can press like one if you want to hear man eater or two if you want to hear rich girl or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Great service. Yeah, but don't I'm never gonna say what it really is again. Whenever we put the complaint line on, you were just not we're just gonna say no, it's the complaint line. <laughs> Wait, how do I take that off? Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay. So where should we start with the links that we have prepared? Uh, I like that you I like that you started with that book because it, it sounds like, well, it's what's in, it inspired you to want to do this topic. Um, I And it's also interesting that he takes it back even further in, in technology, not just the television, because a lot of the articles that I've read about when did politics become entertainment? They go back to the 1960 televised debate um, between JFK and Nixon. And they talk about how television really brought it home for Kennedy because suddenly you weren't just listening to these voices, you were looking at these people and that likability became much more of a factor in terms of the feeling you got from someone. And if you like the way they looked and the way they presented themselves and and so uh, it's so funny to, to, to hear you say that he takes it back even further to how the telegraph changed things. So. Um, let's see. So we could talk a little bit. I put in some links. Uh, I don't know if you wanted to, if you want to start with one of your links, that's, that's fine. But um, I put in some links from the, when Harry Truman was president, just to show you a little bit of what TV, uh, coverage regarding president and politicians was like, just to kind of compare and contrast. And I found links from various presidents uh, after that and how things changed, especially like, you know, when you were just saying uh, with the Kennedy-Nixon debate, I think the 60s was kind of when things kind of shifted because I, I remember reading a while back that Eisenhower hated like TV stuff. Like he didn't get it as a medium for like marketing himself and there's some interesting ads for for his campaigns but he he still hated like putting on makeup and like having to get in front of these cameras he just didn't get it and like you said with the kennedy nixon stuff that really solidified in people's minds about the need to craft image because image. how powerful it is in people's minds and so that in combination with the flower girl ad which we'll talk about that lbj's campaign did scare people from voting for goldwater that did a huge uh had a huge influence on marketing uh, campaigns and playing to people's emotions and their fears and so yeah I, i'd probably say 60s is kind of when things really started uh get going when the circus really started to come to town yeah <laughs> Okay, so let's watch it. This one that you've the, that you've queued up first is President Harry Truman's inauguration from, and this was live coverage at the time from 1949. What were you saying? Oh, just play. You can play a little bit. I was kind of long, and I didn't have like a specific spot to start playing from. I'm entertained already. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. It's about to be renewed. Here at the east portico of the Capitol will shortly be inaugurated the nation's chief executives, Harry S. Truman and Alvin Barclay. This is the 41st inaugural in our country's history, to be witnessed today by some 15,000 here on the Capitol Plaza, and for the first time in history, through the combined facilities of the television industry made visible to millions of Americans throughout the land. For the first time in history. Our reporting, along with Doug Edwards, John Cameron Swayze, and Robert McCormick, alongside one of our camera positions just a few feet from the presidential stand. Under that spacious pavilion, in the sparkling sun and clear cold air of this January day, in about 15 minutes, Alvin W. Barkley will be sworn in as vice president. Immediately following will come the climax of the ceremony before. Look, look at. And here comes the president. Look at all these top hats. Harry 
<laughs> so well dressed. I love it. There's. I wish they could zoom in on the mustaches. <laughs> yeah. Men should still wear top hats <laughs> to important <laughs> events, at least, you know? <laughs> now we're at the center of the platform. Okay, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Is now being reconsecrated and reconsecrated in the person of its first citizen, the president of the United States of America. <laughs> Does that was normal people talk like that? It's he's obviously putting it on because yeah. it's such a fancy event, right? Like and civic righteousness, O oh Lord. I want people to talk like that. Like, what if, like, people at Burger King, when you're, like, getting an order, would you like fries with that? Uh, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. people to be chief executive. May the people's confidence in him never wane. May he continue to hold the high conviction of righteousness and justice, of truth and peace, which have won for him the people's faith and admiration. Touch him, O God, with thy divine wisdom, that he may with humility, yet also with strength and high courage, pursue the purposes and noble ideals which have moved him to we wouldn't hear that today to touch him oh god with wisdom you know of you harry s truman do solemnly swear i harry s truman do solemnly swear you will faithfully execute the office of president of the united states that i will faithfully execute the office of president of the united states and will to the best of your ability and will to the best of my ability Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Harry and Truman, duly elected and sworn. It just seems so much more serious. Like they take it, they take it more seriously than we do. Um, and I know, I know I'm reading into this with the lens of what things are like today, but it just seems more like, even if you didn't vote for him, there's still a respect. And especially since, you know, this is the first time this was being televised, this inauguration I could just imagine people sitting at home. And even if you don't respect who's in the office, you still respect the office itself. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's definitely a lot more formal. And as you say, people respected the institution more than they do today. And you can see that reflected in the coverage and how much more respectful people were <laughs> of the institution. I'm not saying the person always deserves. Right. Which should I show any more of the Truman ones? Uh, you don't have to. I, I just put a couple of other interesting because there was like a lot of firsts. There is the first coast to coast broadcast of him giving a speech and then the first uh, tour of the White House and that. But um, you can go to Eisenhower if you want. Let's go to Eisenhower. Uh, let's see. Should we do the campaign commercial? Yeah, do this. This is uh, it's 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 interesting. I think this is for his first campaign, or maybe it's the second. I think first one, 52. Eisenhower answers America. <laughs> 1952. Eisenhower answers America. <laughs> General, the Democrats are telling me I never had it so good. Can that be true? When that <laughs> <is> true? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, let's do it. <laughs> Who let that new 
you growing here? <laughs> Cut the camera. <laughs> Can that be true? Uh, General, the Democrats are telling me I never had it so good. Can that be true when America is billions in debt? When prices have doubled, when taxes break our backs, yes. and we are still fighting in Korea? It's tragic. And it's time for a change. Wow, we could cut that and run it today and it would still apply. <laughs> <laughs> the Democrats are telling me I never had it so good. Joe Biden's saying the economy is great. <laughs> that, can that be true? <laughs> Why doesn't it like some Republican just like remake this? Ad? Just remake it. Why not? Just remake it. Exactly the same. Ike for president, Ike for president, Ike for president, Ike for president. You like Ike, I like Ike, everybody likes Ike for president. Hang out the banner, beat the drum, we'll take Ike to Washington. We don't want John or Dean or Harry, let's do that. Big Kevin John Biden. Only 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 we got to get where we are going to travel day and night for president. Let Adelaide go the other way. We'll all go with Ike. You like Ike, I like Ike, everybody likes Ike for president. Hang out the banner, beat the drum. We'll take Ike to Washington. We'll take Ike to Washington. This is the one I think somebody should remake today. <laughs> Just and make it black and white like this in 1950 style and a little cartoon, just super positive. You know, <laughs> who would do that? <laughs> who would Swami do or somebody? <laughs> It'd have to be someone geeky. Yeah, that would want to do it, and and somebody who's playful. Now is the time for all good Americans to come to the aid of their country. Vote for Eisenhower. Eisenhower answers America. You know what things cost today. High prices are just driving me crazy. Yes, me. my Mamie gets after me about the high cost of living. It's another reason why I say it's time for a change. Time to get back to an honest dollar and an honest dollar's worth. Eisenhower <laughs> answers America. Yes. General, I'd like to get married, but we couldn't live on the salary I get after taxes. Well, the Democrats are sinking deeper into a bottomless sea of debt. Yes. And demanding more taxes to keep their confused heads above water. Yes. Let's put out a sturdy lifeboat in November. Eisenhower answers America. The Democrats have made mistakes, but aren't their intentions good? Well, if the driver of your school bus runs into a truck, hits a lamppost, drives into a ditch, you don't say his intentions are good. You get a new bus driver. Yes. <laughs> Following is a paid political broadcast by the Eisenhower Nixon California Committee. I know. Let's take That's a look at corruption. Change. You know it rains. Okay, what'd you say? Things never change. Things never change. Yeah, look at the look at the chat. They agree. Uh, Helena says modern problems. Yeah, these are these are modern problems. And uh, <laughs> Raphael says. Uh, Ike has my vote today. <laughs> yeah, this kind of makes me want to vote for Ike. <laughs> He's speaking straight. Should I keep playing this one? Um, I think you should, you can cut it. Okay. But yeah, that's very interesting too. How you had an ad in which a politician was addressing the questions of obviously people who were told to say that, but still, uh, it. it presented itself as he was having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with these people and i think that was something that was done to kind of um show that he's in touch with you know the regular yeah. person that he's not above them and that you know he's agrees with them I mean, it's like my man oh, i didn't say mammy but <laughs> my mother says i have to do, get a be do a better job you know bringing down these prices and so i i, I think it was a interesting ad and one that also took time to kind of um, address some of the you know, or negative aspects of the Democrats, you know, um, kind of like uh, how we eventually get to with <laughs> the flower girl, but um, and not such a, uh, how do I say it? Not such an over the top fearful way, 
you know, it, it's kind of a calmly done um, messaging about, you know, the Democrats and them not uh, doing what uh, they promised to do to help America, but it was something that wasn't done uh, over the top as we'd see coming up in the 60s and 70s, which I, I would argue that, you know, looking at some of these ads, I think they kind of dialed it back down a little bit after the 60s and 70s slightly, but you'll see. Well, um, just one, uh, when he says Mamie, he's talking about his wife. Uh, her name, mama. not his mm. mama. <laughs> Thought he was black, which there are <laughs> conspiracy theories that he is black. You've heard those. No, I haven't like, heard like, that. Mike is the first black president that he's like half or something. I don't know. Really? Mm -hmm. No, I've never heard that conspiracy theory. So that would make Joe Biden the fourth black president. Uh, why is Joe Biden? <laughs> you didn't see that headline from the Hill? No. These leftists, they're calling Joe Biden the third black president because they're counting Bill Clinton as the first uh -huh. and then Obama and then Joe Biden. But I know. What, what about him? Like with Clinton is because... He was had the image of being cool, not that he's actually cool, but and like we'll, we'll play that clip later of him on Insinio. That that's why people say he was like black. But with uh, Biden, I don't understand. Are are black people confused all the time? I mean, yeah, that is true. Okay, I I, <laughs> I take that back. He is. <laughs> are they confused? Uh, it, it was actually it was because it, it's just an article where they're trying to say, look at all he's done for black people. It's just dumb. It's really uh, dumb. They're trying yeah. to make it a thing. It's not a thing. Yeah. But the headline was saying, yeah, third black president, Joe Biden. In seriousness, they were saying that. <laughs> okay, so this one, you want me to show this one? Dwight Eisenhower in the first color TV broadcast? Uh, yeah, just show a little bit of it because I just think it's interesting. So if you go, yeah, just scroll back uh, or go backwards. Sorry. Wait, go back? Yeah. So right there. So this is the guy. Yeah, press this. Play right there. White picture. By pressing this button, which I now do, the cameras are transmitting a live color picture. Whoa. When you step before <laughs> them, you will be making your first appearance on color television from Washington. 3,000 miles away in our studios in Burbank, California, this entire program is being recorded on electronic tape. The picture, the color, the sound are being captured for posterity through this recording system, which NBC began using on a full-scale basis only last month to change to daylight time. It will permit us, sir, to retelecast this program to many sections of the United States several hours later today, and with such true fidelity that millions of Americans will see this ceremony as though it were being enacted at that time. I have a strip of this new tape. I have asked our engineers to make two tape copies of this program. One will be sent, Mr. President, to the White House for your personal retention. The other will be presented to the Library of Congress so that its archives may permanently possess a visual record in color of this significant occasion. I'm just now curious we have created one as to how many people actually had a color TV when this happened. So he presses the button and nothing happens. It's just black and white well, for everyone with a black and white set. Yeah. Uh, uh, you're like, oh, looks the same. Hmm. Thank you very much. That Eisenhower lied about color TV. <laughs> what is this, Arnold? Distinguished guests, fellow Americans. I think all of us realize that in these fast moving times, it is highly important that our nation's capital should be. attached to every single citizen in this country by the very fastest, best kind of communications. Decisions of a nation and of a government that at one time uh, could uh, tolerate three or four weeks of study now demand almost instantaneous a reaction. So it is again apparent that unless our citizenry can be informed of the things that happen in the world and are reflected uh, through the 
eyes of uh, legislative and executive leaders in such a way that they may understand exactly what these things mean, then the United States cannot react as it should. Now, uh, today, as I came through this building, which will itself make these communications better, more rapid, more comprehensive. It's so funny because he's talking about this, assuming this is going to make things better. <laughs> but going back to where we started this episode with the book Amusing Ourselves to Death, and his point being that all of this rapid communication has resulted in this Huxley-like dystopia where we have so much information that anything important is meaningless. It's just buried, it's forgotten. Look at the Twitter files. It's like it didn't even happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's so interesting to hear him talk about it in, in these positive terms, which I can imagine at that moment, I would have thought this is positive too. Yes, more technology more information, rapid access. Uh, but then, you know, looking at where we've ended up, it's not always, you can't see those repercussions sometimes. You can't see the negative, con possible negative consequences sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, like if you can contrast it with say like reading about news and various information, you can read at your own pace. And oftentimes people will, uh, they'll reread, you know, certain paragraph that's maybe dense or kind of goes over the head or, or they'll look up certain terminology. That's what I do when I'm reading something that's pretty dense. But with television, it goes at its own pace. And yeah, if, if you're recording on DVR or something, you can rewind. And in the past, certainly they didn't really have that option. But even with that option today, how many people do that if something kind of, you know, goes over the head? Do they really you know, rewind and try to listen to it again yeah. to try yeah. to understand it. No, they don't. And so, again, like you know, saying earlier, it's just this constant bombardment of information and not a lot of it gets retained. And there's been studies showing that people tend to retain information much better through reading and audio, too. But when you combine it with the visual stuff, it, it kind of uh, puts the brain in, I don't say to sleep, but kind of puts the brain in a certain zone where yeah. you know a lot of that information just isn't being soaked in to the brain. You're exactly right. That's part of the reason uh, my pastor, uh, Bradley Helgerson, that he, his sermons, that our church puts them all out on the church YouTube channel. If anybody wants to see them, they're at uh, Church on the Square. But that's part of the reason he's now started, uh, there's a volunteer in our church who's transcribing all of them and putting them into a substack because most people retain information better, as you're saying, when they read it and they take time with it rather than hearing it. And our culture is just, we're so inundated now with technology. We're tied to these phones and in this TikTok world that we're in now, I've mentioned this before, but a lot of younger people that I've come into contact with in one of my gig jobs, they don't even listen to songs all the way through. They skip through their favorite songs. They listen to 30 seconds here and they get tired and move on to the next one. Um, and I've even, you know, you and I as a generation that weren't raised with these devices, it's, it affects us as well. I mean, even while Eisenhower was talking here, I was, I had to catch myself because I was looking to see if there was a two times the speed button. Cause I'm like, <laughs> taking a long time to say this. <laughs> yeah. All of our attention spans have been affected by it. It's crazy. It's crazy, right? Like I caught myself. I observed myself thinking that like, I need to speed this up. <laughs> <laughs> or play some background music. Well, it's weird because, you know, I, I, sometimes I'll, I'll sit there and think, why do I need to have music or something playing in the background while I'm working or doing okay. something? It's like this constant need for noise. It's like, why is that? It's like my brain has been rewired in a way where I just need that constant stimulation no matter yes. what I'm doing. Yes. It's, I mean, it's happening to us too. Helena says they skip through their favorite songs. Yes, I've, I've shared this anecdote before, so apologies to people who've heard it, but they will create their own playlist and then listen to like 30 seconds of each song and just go to the next one. It's, and they're all singing along. They know the words. It's like their favorite songs and 
but they don't have the attention span to hear the song all the way through. <laughs> it's mostly, I've only seen younger people doing this, but it's weird. Uh, okay, I'm gonna take this one down. What, what, which one should I show next? Uh, let's go to ALBJ. Oh, okay. This, this is the infamous uh, flower ad for younger people probably haven't seen this, but this might be the most well-known political campaign ad of all time. It's pretty crazy. I still just get, I, I still amazed that this was an actual campaign ad. Like it's so over the top. It's like something that you would see in a sketch comedy. Thank you to our wonderful mod, Two Sisters and Some Yarn, who just gifted five D program memberships to folks. So grab those up if you want them. Thank you so much, lady. Okay, we're gonna watch it. Here's, uh, here's the Daisy ad, 1964 LBJ. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> vote, vote for me or die. <laughs> vote for me or be annihilated. <laughs> Seriously surprised that they didn't do this with Trump. Like people who hated Trump put out ads like that. I can't believe they didn't either. Yeah. I, I can't. Why? Well, I, I. I. Yeah. I mean, they basically they've called him every possible the worst name that you could in the book and compared him to every dictator throughout history and yeah yeah if somebody didn't have, like, vote for vote don't vote for trump or there'll be an there'll be annihilation if you do wow it's so funny too how they just at the end they just uh, vote for <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> horrible destruction and death like vote for me because you can read it as a threat each like each way like don't vote for me like vote for me or this is gonna if you don't this is gonna happen or if you vote for me this is gonna happen <laughs> i'm like wait which way is the threat going <laughs> well if you pull up that ad up or excuse me the article i put underneath that about this ad mm -hmm. it goes into a little bit of detail about the development of the ad and the advertising agency that was involved uh, with creating it and pretty interesting uh facts about it like they, they they go in and talk about how this ad was only shown once oh look at this none your business in the chat says i saw that commercial when it first aired okay this article is from the smithsonian magazine how the daisy ad changed everything about political advertising since the famous television spot ran in 1964, advertising agencies have sold presidential candidates as if they were cars or soap. On September 7, 1964, a 60-second TV ad changed American politics forever. A three-year-old girl in a simple dress counted as she plucked daisy petals in a sun-dappled field. Her words were supplanted by a mission control countdown followed by a massive nuclear blast in a classic mushroom shape. The message was clear, if only implicit. Presidential candidate Barry Goldwater was a genocidal maniac who threatened the world's future. Two months later, President Lyndon Johnson won easily, and the emotional political attack ad, visceral, terrifying, and risky, was made. Half a century later, we live in the world of negative political advertising that Daisy Girl pioneered, but there are some curious aspects to the story. First, though it is a famous ad, 
Daisy Girl, as the ad is known, only ran once. Secondly, it didn't even mention Goldwater's name. And finally, by the time the ad ran, Goldwater's chances against LBJ were slim, even though the ad is often falsely credited with assuring the win. And there were two dozen other ads from LBJ's camp, humorous, informative, dark, and neurotic. Daisy became the iconic spot of its era, not because it was the first Johnson ran in 1964. We remember it primarily because of its brilliant, innovative approach to negative advertising. Daisy and the other ads were made by Doyle Dane Birnbach, DDB, an eclectic group of admin at a medium-sized Madison Avenue firm with a stellar reputation for groundbreaking campaigns for Volkswagen and Avis. It was Mad Men. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't set out to revolutionize political advertising. What they wanted to do was to break the established rules of political ads, then dominated by stodgy 30-minute speeches mixed with shorter policy-focused spots by injecting creativity and emotion. Bill Birnbach, the firm's principal founder, had, a, had long maintained advertising was an art, not a science. He favored intuition. He often reminded his employees, playing it safe can be the most dangerous thing in the world because you're presenting people with an idea that they've seen before and you won't have an impact. Famously dismissive of advertising driven purely by research, Bernbach had written a revolutionary memo in 1947 that laid out the philosophy that would eventually characterize his firm's work. Quote, advertising is fundamentally persuasion and persuasion happens to be not a science, but an art, he brashly told his then employer, Gray Advertising. It's that creative spark that I'm so jealous of for our agency and that I am so desperately fearful of losing I don't want acad ac academicians, is it academicians? <laughs> Academics. I don't want scientists. I want people who do the right things. I want people who do inspiring things, end quote. Inspired by Birnbach's philosophy of relying upon instinct as much or more than research, DDB produced an extraordinary and memorable series of spots for Johnson. The firm capitalized upon Goldwater's reckless statements by providing viewers with indelible images DDB mocked Goldwater's vote against the nuclear test ban treaty with a spot showing nothing but a girl licking an ice cream cone as a female announcer spoke ominously about the fallout from atmospheric nuclear testing and how it might enter the food supply. Wow, that one sounds just as terrifying. <laughs> Goldwater had once bragged that the nation might be better off if we could just saw off the eastern seaboard and let it float out to sea. <laughs> so Western seaboard now. No. Yeah, the Western Seaboard now. Who hasn't said that about California? So DBB served up a humorous 60-second spot of a saw slicing the East Coast from the styr a styrofoam model of the United States. In another spot, DDB mocked Goldwater's statement about privatizing Social Security by showing a pair of hands ripping up a Social Security card. Viewers had never seen anything like this. It's not that previous presidential campaigns had only been polite affairs. Dwight Eisenhower ran negative TV spots against his Democratic opponent, um, Stevenson, in 1952, subtly tying him to alleged corruption in Truman administration officials. Stevenson's spots attacked Eisenhower in 1956. John F. K. attacked Richard Nixon's record as vice president in the 1960 campaign. Goldwater's attacks against Johnson in 1964 were unrelenting. But in almost every case, the attacks were rational, fact-based arguments. DDB's innovation was not negative advertising per se. It was rather to help make emotions, primarily fear, a staple of political spot. So it's they're saying it's it's not that doing a negative ad was new. It's it's that using people's emotions and stoking fear that was new. Which makes me think of the COVID years, the recent mm -hmm. COVID years. Um, but, but yeah, stoking it yeah. with images primarily instead of, you know, speech like we're talking about with Eisenhower. It's very calm conversation uh, happening between him and the people uh, he was trying to reach. But with this, it's just space <laughs> like you're going to die unless you vote for LBJ. Yeah, it's just something that really speaks to, to something deep in us to see that imagery. It's just it's on a whole nother level. And I think that's what was awakened with this ad. It's something we still see to this day. But like I said, not to this degree, but still they know the power of images and 
they're uh, very cognizant about the way they use that and targeting us. Um, it just makes me think about so much that we've seen in the past year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Should I pull up the, the Hubert Humphrey one? Yeah, pull up this Hubert Humphrey ad. This is the last ad I have. But uh, I had never seen this one before. This one's actually kind of funny. I think this was, uh, I think it was pro Hubert Humphrey. I can't remember if it was pro or anti, but Hubert Humphrey was LBJ's uh, vice president. Okay. Let's see. Sorry. One it's second. pretty good, too. I'm like, this is pretty effective ad, actually. It, it still uses kind of emotion, but it doesn't use so much fear as much as it uses humor my do you have anybody in your family who talked about Hubert Humphrey no I don't my grandfather hated Hubert Humphrey <laughs> <laughs> why um because he's the one that promised to put a chicken in every pot right in a car in every garage mm, nice <laughs> hold on I'm having trouble with this sharing this tab give me one more try Okay, here we go. This is the one, right? Laughter. Yep, that's the one. <laughs> that's insane i know <laughs> i mean you know, humphrey ran that i would not vote for him because that <laughs> laughter is maniacal and crazy really? yeah it's creepy but I, I i think it's effective people a little bit i see that but i think it's effective because you know it's portraying that person as a joke and i think that's like one of the reasons why a lot of politicians and people you know on the far left hate say memes it's because how easily people are able to meme uh, certain people or ideas coming from that side of the aisle and make it seem like a big joke <laughs> to people and i think that's one of why it's so effective you know because even if you don't know much about uh those people who they're talking about it's just the uh, seeing the that visual of somebody watching the television laughing their ass off at the idea of you know spiro agnew you know coming you know vice president or president i guess so uh yeah it's creepy um by the way i have a, a correction to make i'm sorry it's it's the two H's got me confused. It wasn't, it wasn't um, Hubert Humphrey that my grandfather hated or who said he would put a chicken in every pot. It was Herbert Hoover, another HH. -H. Mm -hmm. Herbert Hoover, uh, who promised a chicken in every pot and two cars in every garage. Mm. Oh, that Herbert Hoover. Yeah. Uh, anyway, sorry, I got that wrong. Corrections in real time. <laughs> Kandra says Hoover was a great man. I don't know. I just know what my papa thought. <laughs> so he never really complained about it. It's really funny because, you know, it didn't matter who was president or who was running in the when I was a kid in the 80s and 90s. He would still just complain about um, Hoover. <laughs> like, and he never got over it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, you want to go down to uh, start talking about debates just a little bit? Yeah, so let's talk about the one that that a lot of the articles and, and books sort of credit with changing everything, whether it's right or wrong to, to credit this one. But they talked about the uh, television and the Nixon-Kennedy debates. So let's start with that one. So this was the, I believe this uh, video pulling up from the first debate they had in 1960. And this is uh, the infamous debate uh, is because people, apparently people listening to on the radio uh, believe that Nixon had won the debate, but people who yes. watch TV believe that JFK won the debate. And 
Uh, people attribute this to Nixon being a little under the weather and not clean shaven and JFK just having more nicer coiffed hair. And so the image that JFK projected uh, stuck in people's minds and people believed him to be more presidential than Richard Nixon. I, that's, that's what, it, so I, it's been a years, but there's a book I read, I think it was by Mark Crispin. What's his name? Hold on. Mark Crispin Miller, and where he talks about this debate. And I had forgotten that fact that if they, when they polled people, people who were just listening said, oh, Nixon won. But the power of the image, the power of the visual image of Kennedy, the people who watched it said, no, Kennedy won. Um, also, I'm going to give it up before I hit play on this to so people in the chat who are educating us about Hoover. I don't know. I'm just telling what my grandfather said. Nerdy Girl says Hoover had a great career post-presidency. He did a lot for humanity, lived to his 90s. Um, Kandra says he warned of the crash, but the Dems kept going. Banking was totally at fault. Uh, and... Someone else says Hoover, uh, Hater Saurus. Hater Saurus, 76, says Hoover is a great man compared to this crop of clowns we call leaders, mm -hmm. ironically. Okay. Thank you, guys. Okay, let's, let's watch some of this one. Good evening. The television and radio stations of the United States and their affiliated stations are proud to provide facilities for a discussion of issues in the current political campaign by the two major candidates for the presidency. The candidates need no introduction. The Republican candidate, Vice President Richard M. Nixon, and the Democratic candidate, Senator John F. Kennedy. According to rules set by the candidates themselves, each man shall make an opening statement of approximately eight minutes duration and a closing statement of approximately three minutes duration. In between, the candidates will answer or comment upon answers to questions put by a panel of correspondents. In this, the first discussion in a series of four uh, joint appearances, the subject matter has been agreed will be restricted to internal or domestic American matters. And now for the first opening statement by Senator John F. Kennedy. Smith, Nixon. In the election of 1860, Abraham Lincoln said the question was whether this nation could exist half slave or half free. In the election of 1960 and with the world around us, the question is whether the world will exist half slave or half free, whether it will move in the direction of freedom, in the direction of the road that we are taking, or whether it will move in the direction of slavery. I think it will depend in great measure upon what we do here in the United States that we build, on the kind of strength that we maintain. We discuss tonight domestic issues, but I would not want that to be any implication to be given that this does not involve directly our struggle with Mr. Khrushchev for survival. Mr. Khrushchev is in New York, and he maintains the communist offensive throughout the world because of the productive power of the Soviet Union itself. The Chinese communists have always had a large population. I'm going to skip ahead, if that's okay. Can I skip yeah, ahead to, that's fine. and I notice in the chat, some people are saying Kennedy looks relaxed and LBJ looks strained, <laughs> which means, you know, Nixon, that yeah. might, sorry, Nixon, which means that that might be why people who were watching it said, oh, Kennedy won. And people who were listening thought Nixon won. Okay. Let's, let's listen to and watch Nixon. Senator Kennedy. The things that Senator Kennedy has said, many of us can agree with. There is no question but that we cannot discuss our internal affairs in the United States without recognizing that they have a tremendous bearing on our international position. There is no question but that this nation cannot stand still because we are in a deadly competition, a competition not only with the men in the Kremlin, but the men in Peking. We're ahead in this competition, as Senator Kennedy, I think, is implied. But when you're in a race, the only way to stay ahead is to move ahead. And I subscribe completely to the spirit that Senator Kennedy has expressed tonight, the spirit that the United States should move ahead. Where then do we disagree? I think we disagree on the implication of his remarks tonight and on the statements that he has made 
on many occasions during his campaign to the effect that the United States has been standing still. We heard tonight, for example, the statement made that our growth in national product last year was the lowest of any industrial nation in the world. I don't know. Do you do you get do you get a different feeling from each of these guys? Not, I, I don't see the uh, yeah I don't see it with Nixon as much like the people are saying that uh, he's come across as kind of you know not all present and uh, how he kind of looked disheveled like I, I don't get that as much you know he, certainly JFK I think most people would think he's better looking than Nixon so maybe that is a big uh, factor not just you know Nixon's, you know, conditions in terms of being sick or not, but the fact JFK was just considered to be more handsome than it's women, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Gavin Newsom effect. Uh. Oh, gross. <laughs> oh, gross. Women. How could you be so foolish? <laughs> Wait, I'm talking about Gavin Newsom, not, not Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's so interesting. Okay. You know, the other thing that occurs to me as I'm watching this, much like the the Truman footage of the inauguration, is it seems so maybe because it was so new and because it was a different time and a different culture that there's a respectability to it that current debates don't have at all. Um, in fact, when I first uh, was dating my husband, when we first started dating, this would have been this would have been in the fall of 2019. I, I told him one night we, this is when we were still drinking, you know, and we were hanging out at some friend's place and, and watching TV and, and having drinks. And I said, well, let's put it on the, uh, let's put it on the democratic candidates debate. And he was like, really? Why? It's so serious. I'm like, no, it, it's going to be funny. If it's not funny, we're not going to watch it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and he still brings that up. The fact that it was like, that first sort of like observation that he had, I think maybe that, oh gosh, this is all ridiculous, isn't it? It's kind of hilarious. And it, it feels that way to me now. Like if there's a debate on, I kind of want to hear what they have to say, but I also just want to take in the spectacle because I know it's going to be a clown show. And this one, this Nixon, Kennedy one, it just, it just has this air of, seriousness about it where i don't think anyone would ever put that on and say this is going to be funny you know <laughs> okay how what about this one the dan quell one uh let's see uh so yes so this is the uh lloyd uh, benson um famous singer when he and dan quell were having vice presidential debate in 88 and I, I think this is the start of the what we have now with debates because politicians know that most people don't watch these debates, that people are just tuning into news programs to see clips of it. And now with Twitter, people are looking up you know clips on Twitter. But it seems to me that since then, so many politicians have tried to come up with these witty sayings or slams on people that they know is going to be picked up by the media and played ad nauseum and are hoping that because people don't watch the rest of the debate, that people will see that and think that this person is much more astute or qualified than the persons or persons that they're debating against. And I have an example of a recent or a couple of ones that we'll show in a moment of some newer ones. Uh, that kind of show uh, where we've gotten with some of these zingers, but this is the infamous, uh, you know, Jack Kennedy uh, zinger. To do that, I will be prepared not only because of my service in the Congress, but because of my ability to communicate and to lead. It is not just age, it's accomplishments, it's experience. I have far more experience than many others that sought the office of vice president of this country. I have as much experience in the Congress as Jack Kennedy did when he sought the presidency. I will be prepared to deal with the people in the Bush administration if that unfortunate event would ever occur. Senator Benson. 
Senator, I served with Jack Kennedy. I knew Jack Kennedy. Jack Kennedy was a friend of mine. Senator, you're no Jack Kennedy. Oh! <laughs> 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 oh, and then he came up with that. I mean, obviously, how would he have known that? You know, Dan Quill's about to compare himself with Jack. You know what else is funny hmm. is while he's delivering that to him and he's looking at him while he's saying it. Look at Dan Quell. Dan Quell never looks at him. Dan yeah. Quell looks like a schoolboy who's just been scolded. He knew he walked in a trap, or he put himself in a trap. He's just looking Senator straight Yardo ahead. Jack Kennedy. That made it worse. Yeah. It made it worse that you're just staring straight ahead like you're taking a scolding. <laughs> I wish somebody would take this video and splice it with like audience reactions from like Death Comedy Jam and the 90s of black people like <laughs> getting up and like running and dancing. You do that. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, wait, let me make a note. Death Comedy Jam. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but yeah i think that's when it all began and uh we've seen a lot of people who've tried to have these zinger zingers that they planned ahead of time but this next zinger i want to play i don't believe this was planned ahead at all and this is uh and... yeah okay so a little admission here now when this happened i hated him i was fully in the leftist cult uh, I didn't ever watch any of his speeches. I didn't know really, my, I didn't have my own opinion about him, which I now believe a lot of people don't have their own opinions about things. They just get, especially on the left anyway, they, they get these received, they receive these opinions. They're told what to think. They never engage with source material. And so it wasn't until later, much later after I had come out of the woke cult and I started looking back and watching some of Trump's speeches and that that I really developed an appreciation for a sense of humor. He is part mm. comedian. Yes, and that's the thing. A lot of people who hate him don't want to admit just how funny he is. Now, I saw on the Amazon page for Amusing Ourselves to Death, CNN wrote some little blurb that's at the top where I forget exactly what they say, but they, they of course take a shot at Trump and you know try to say oh you know this book you know neil postman was writing about trump was like no i think neil postman even though the book in the 80s i think what he was writing about describes barack obama more so than trump wow because barack obama in my opinion is the most manufactured politician of all time because i remember when uh he got put at the forefront of democratic nominees in 2008 i was a democrat at the time and i had never heard of this guy and i remember thinking where did this guy come from this this black guy half black who has this weird name who's all of a sudden you know the leading candidate come to right. nominee and properly right. the, the president and when you look at all the support he had when you look at the vague uh campaign slogans which they all are i mean make america great again it's a little vague but it's a little bit more specific than hope and change i mean hope and change a lot more vague i mean that can mean anything and you also look at the support that uh he got from the media and magazines yes. you know, he was being bridget brown being the he cool was president you know all these magazines trying to gaslight us and telling us how beautiful michelle obama was when she's not <laughs> <laughs> it, right. so annoying. Wow, and, tell us how you really feel I, i'm just speaking truth here uh but then you had trump come along and he didn't have that support at all and he had the meaning of trying to say that he was second coming of the German dictator from World War II. But when you have, you know, stuff like in the clip we're about to play, which was very endearing to a lot of people, it's not the reason why people voted for him. I mean, it factors in a little bit, but I think people voted for Trump because he was, even though he was uncouth a bit and crass at times because he was wasn't manufactured because he was the opposite of Barack Obama like when yes. you have Barack Obama who's benefited from you know this this 
evolution of technology. He was first president that kind of took advantage of social media because by that time, Facebook was a thing. Twitter wasn't quite a thing until 2009, but you had Facebook. Uh, you had this guy who was, you know, poised as this person who was going to reverse everything that George Bush did and the Republicans did. And when he got in office, he just kept much of that stuff in place and, and he just had, added on top of it. He had and so a at that point, image. yeah. So at that point, a lot of people start seeing through that and start seeing through this fakeness that he and George Bush, because George Bush pushes himself as being this uh, all shucks kind of guy who just loves apple pie and Jesus. And a lot of people start seeing through that. And a lot of people who hated Trump couldn't understand why a lot of the base, specifically the evangelical base, much of them who voted for Bush and those type of Republicans, neocon Republicans would vote for Trump. They're like, well, he says grab women by the P word and stuff. It's like, but you, you, you don't understand that people understand that that's fake. George Bush and Barack Obama were fake. And what did we get for that? trillions of dollars in debts, yes. wars, National yes. Defense Authorization Act. People were tired of that and they were willing to take a chance on somebody like Trump, even though he is very crass. You know, people were willing to overlook that because they think that he, specifically because he was hated so much by those phonies in the Republican and Democratic parties, that there must be some truth in him being an actual threat to the system. And that's the main appeal. And the humor stuff is just on top of it. Yeah. I mean, I can't say it any better than you did. Um, it was that it, it, Romulus in chat kind of backs up what you're saying. Trump is authentic. What you see is what you get. And I think you're right, especially as compared to Obama, who was so manufactured. I mean, I voted for Obama twice. Hmm. And I know you voted for him once. Mm -hmm. uh, but looking back, oh, man, what a, I, th I feel like he was packaged and sold to me. <laughs> And, and it was it was so calculated, his whole image, everything. Yeah. How cool he is. Yeah. And buying in the Kool-Aid. Somebody in the chat said, hope is not a strategy. I think it was Texas Sheep Lady. Yeah, they were selling hope. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, again, it's so vague. You can just project what you want onto that. And it will mean whatever you want. And it's like, because, you know, Obama didn't advertise himself as being, you know, first black president. But the media was all talking about that. And so people like that change part in his slogan, you know, had double meaning of changing from Republican to Democratic administration. That's supposed to be better than the last one, but also having a black face, half black face, because I don't like calling the first black president dudes mulatto. But having this, you know, half black face now being the leader of the United States and the quote unquote free world, that was the change there. And that's unfortunately we didn't see much change for the positive or mostly most of his time in, in office. And people were just desperate for something different. And like the comment said, something more authentic. Yeah. OK, well, let's watch this. Let's watch this bit of comedy. Now, if you're on the left and you stumbled onto this channel, uh, just just try. I know it's going to be hard. Just try and set your feelings about Trump and your hatred aside and just watch this as a bit of judge it as a bit of comedy and see what you think about his delivery and you don't like fat pigs dogs slobs <laughs> and disgusting animals your twitter account only rosie several... o'donnell so good. It was well beyond Rosie O'Donnell. Yes, I'm sure it was. Your Twitter <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, it's, uh, see, I remember, like, in 2015, 2016, thinking that uh, he didn't have much of a chance to become president. But I was watching one of the Republican debates and he turned to jeb bush and was like your brother lied about the iraq war you know legal war and the whole audience booed him he's like, shut up lobbyist shut up and i remember <laughs> thinking like whatever little chance he had coming president was done with but i was wrong and i think that's one of the things that a lot of people who hate him particularly people on the democrat side don't acknowledge because he got an office not having to play the game quite to the degree that republicans 
like Bush did because yes. they were very war hawkish and they claimed to love Jesus more than anybody else. And here you have Trump who he had some war hawk stuff there, but he didn't start any new wars during the presidency. And he, you know, definitely didn't want to go into Syria, you know, like yeah. a lot of the neocons wanted. But you also had someone who I know he calls himself a Christian and who am I to judge? But yeah, no one's going to think he's the super Christian, I guess. Put it that no. way after his infamous, you know, two Corinthians. And so you had someone who's not as war hawkish as Republicans have passed and certainly not as evangelical Christian as politicians on the Republican side have presented themselves uh, in the past, you know, 30 years, 40 years since Reagan. And so that I would think would be something that people on the left would want to celebrate given that, you know, historically they've talked about being anti-war and they have a disdain for evangelical Christianity. So wouldn't you want someone who's not as much of those things that you hate? <laughs> yeah, no. I think they hated him so much because they, well, he kind of, in a way, exposes what a clown show it is. I think he sort of, uh, I heard this comparison once um, where, I forget who made this comparison, but I thought it was so apt, where they were talking about how Alex Jones is a bit of a wrestling kind of figure. I mean, he's a political commentator, but he's also like Trump, part comedian, part troll, part wrestling figure. And Trump's a little like that. He's larger than life. and everything that they, he just accentuates it he just makes it obvious that it's ridiculous mm -hmm. he yeah. he he's kind of he's a light that just shine it shines a light on that like oh this whole thing is a clown show i don't know if that makes sense but he's yeah. so over the top that that um it's sort of like seeing behind the curtain a yeah. bit. And, 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 and this, what's so frustrating to me, a lot of people who just can't understand his appeal is like, yeah, I understand that you don't like that, you know, like I said earlier, that he's uncouth and kind of all over the place sometimes and just says whatever comes to his, his mind. But compare that to the system we have, like, that's crazy. Yeah. Like, I mean, like I said earlier, with all these wars and certainly, you know, the lockdowns, COVID and all this stuff that governments, you know, local, state and federal governments have been doing for the past half decade. Like, that's crazy. <laughs> like, why aren't you more upset at that than, you know, Trump, who's just, you know, says whatever. I mean, at the end of the day, those are words. I'm, I'm more concerned about policies and policies of previous presidents, both Republican and Democrat, have been far worse than the words that Donald Trump has said. But most people are not concerned about policies, as as we've talked about in this whole episode, starting with the beginning, where you're telling us about amusing ourselves to death, because there's so much information, there's information overload, and nothing that's important really matters or sticks. And everybody would rather talk about, I mean, look at, I've mentioned it before, but right now, this whole thing with DeSantis and his boots and people saying that he wears lifts in his boots and this boot gate thing and this fascination with, you know, instead of talking about policies or how someone might perform as, as the president or how they've performed as governor, um, it, everyone's talking about the boots. And it's like, how do you turn that around if you're him? You know, how do you yeah. get people to, to, when you go on podcasts and stuff, to ask you about your policies again? It's, you know, he made a, if he is wearing lifts, he made a terrible faux pas. If he's not wearing lifts, he needs to do something definitively to own that whole situation. Like wear the craziest, gaudiest, most amazing boots possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just to, just to take control of that back. Um, yeah. Or just, yeah. Have a sense of humor about it. Laugh about it. If it is true. I mean, Trump gets made fun of because of his terrible hair all the time. And you've seen him. Uh, he just he's, takes he's, it on the chin and laughs about yeah. it. Infamously, infamously when he was on J Jimmy Fallon's show in the lead up to the 2016 election, I believe. And Jimmy Fallon, he allowed Jimmy Fallon to rub his hair and stuff. He was having fun with it. And Jimmy Fallon, of course, got a lot of flack for that. But yeah, he kind of owns it. So uh, this, so this, uh, I, I put this in there as a highlight of really bad zingers because yes. this is a zinger that was completely uh, fabricated before this uh, debate occurred. This is from the second Republican debate this year, and Chris Christie has a really, really terrible zinger 
That's so embarrassing. Well, any leftists who don't actually watch Trump and don't know, he he gives nicknames to everyone. And so I think this was kind of Chris Christie trying to do this something similar. Anyway, here we go. By Chris Christie. No one up here is going to call you Donald Trump anymore. We're going to call you Donald Duck. All right. <laughs> 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 it's so terrible. It's, so it's, so so it's like expecting everyone to laugh. We're going to call you Donald Duck. <laughs> it's so stupid. His face is like, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think I saw Chrissy Mayer, the comedian. I think I saw her. Yeah, when that came out, she tweeted something about how she was going to be opening for this hilarious comedian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was like, we're not going to call you Donald Trump anymore. We're going to call you Donald Duck. <laughs> oh, little kid, write that for him. <laughs> he probably wrote it himself. <laughs> Singers don't work if they are premeditated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. That's too good. Um. <laughs> let's talk i think uh let's see yeah. are we gonna do the entertainment show appearances? yeah let's talk a little bit about this so i think another uh factor in politics becoming entertainment has been a number of politicians who have guest starred on various programs comedy shows and in dramas but this was done primarily for them to try to seem more like a ordinary person <laughs> but for them to seem more like a relatable person that they mm -hmm. have a sense of humor about themselves and so uh, I, I found some things uh, about various guest appearances this first link you have is uh, Nixon's uh, appearance uh, on the on laughing uh, laughing yeah NBC beautiful downtown Burbank Hello, Governor Rockefeller. Oh no, I don't think we could get Mr. Nixon to stand still for a socket to me. Socket to me? Fairly <laughs> 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 <Badly> done. <laughs> socket to me? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> the idea of this guy, you know, whose definition of a square, trying to be cool and laugh at is just embarrassing and you know he didn't understand that lingo like socket to me what should i pull up the article about this socket to me line sure let's just read a little bit of it just the very beginning this is also yeah. from the smithsonian magazine the headline in 1968 when nixon said socket to me on laughing tv was never quite the same again <laughs> I like how the Smithsonian Magazine, they all, all of their headlines are like, and then things were never the same again. <laughs> the other dun, dun, dun. That's what the other article said. Okay. The show's rollicking one-liners and body routines paved the way for Cider Night Live, another cutting-edge television satire. We're living in a golden age of presidential comedy on television. Presidential candidate Donald Trump hosted Saturday Night Live in November of 2015, igniting a firestorm of controversy about the benefit the appearance might have given his campaign. Hillary Clinton had appeared on the sketch comedy program the previous month, as Bernie Sanders would in February of 2016. Impersonations of Trump, Barack Obama, Clinton, and others have been the mainstay of late night comedy for years, not to mention politically charged monologues from such television luminaries as Stephen Colbert, John Oliver, and Samantha Bee. It may seem normal now, but it hasn't always been this way. Following the tumult of the Great Depression and World War II, the August institution of the presidency was seen as too dignified. Yes. <laughs> That's what we're talking about with that old footage, right? Too dignified to be subjected to anything more than the most mild and bipartisan ribbing, especially on that lowbrow medium known as television. That all changed in 1968 when Richard Nixon appeared on Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In. And then it goes on to talk about how it paved the way for Siren Night Live, launched the careers of many comedians. Uh, perhaps the most long-lasting and influential moment in Laugh-In's incredibly successful five-year run, however, was that cameo appearance by presidential candidate Richard Nixon in 1968. It wasn't very funny by modern standards, but Nixon's stilted delivery of the show's signature catchphrase, Sock it to me? was part of a revolutionary effort to reach out to younger voters. 
taken against the advice of Nixon's campaign managers. So interesting. Okay. So that was major one. And then I have another one. And then I have an article uh, summarizes some of the other cameos. But this is another big one. And probably, I would say, probably the second big, or maybe might be probably the biggest one, actually, I think, cameo. Uh, Let's talk about this. Yeah. Yeah. The pandering, the cool, <laughs> the, the image cultivation of look what a cool dude I am. I play saxophone. Okay, here we go. And then he had it in the bag. <laughs> <laughs> it's all it takes. Get the black vote. The black vote and the women vote. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, people attribute that to really helping his campaign, appearing on Senior Hall show, which had a large black audience. And that's why a lot of people to this day say Bill Clinton is the first black president. Yes. I, um, I've got another one to show. And it's not an appearance on a TV show, but it's, I think it's related. I think this is the best place to put this one in because it's a similar kind of performance to show, to, to, to cultivate the part of the image to show how cool you are. Can I, can I show this quick clip? Yeah. Okay. Um, here we go. Now, fortunately, this wasn't enough to put it in the bag for this guy. First time I ever voted Republican was to vote against this douchebag. Here we go. This is Beto. Uh, Skateboarding in the Whataburger parking lot. All right, everybody share this. Beto O'Rourke is on a skateboard on a in skateboard. a Whataburger parking lot. I don't know He's if it gets more Beto. You got to share this. Yep, I'm sure he I, just, you know, happened to pull out a skateboard and start skating right then. Yeah. You know, there's not that this was pre planned, of course. Right. That guy is so, so cheesy. I don't know if it gets more Beto. <laughs> and that's the thing, too, nowadays when these politicians are taking advantage of social media, they're trying to make all these videos that come across as being kind of organic. Like you remember the uh, Elizabeth Warren uh, video where she's taking like video of her at home and she's having all, a beer. All, yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, just drinking a beer. Oh, it's my favorite beer. Sh Sh Shinner. I love Shinner. Sock it to me. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one more of this guy. Look, he did this so much. Oh, come on. Yeah, I remember that. I think I tweeted at you once that uh, you remind me of Poochie from The Simpsons. <laughs> <laughs> exactly like that. I'm cool. I'm cool. Was he wearing the shades? <laughs> yeah. The and then, and then, yeah. <laughs> and a skateboarder, you get backwards hat. <laughs> this like, middle aged yeah. man trying to identify with young people. It's embarrassing. It's like the uh, the meme, the Steve Shimmy meme. Hello, fellow young yeah. people. <laughs> Oh, man. Okay. But if you pull up this article, I'm going to, you know, skim through this. You don't have to read everyone, but this just has some of the prominent cameos that politicians have uh, done over the, the years. Okay. Oh, go away, Ad. Oh, my goodness. Nancy Reagan promoted her anti-drug movement on an episode of Different Strokes in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Well, you can tell she was really effective on the child actors in that series. <laughs> uh, in the 1980s, the First Lady was busy promoting her Just Say No campaign in answer to the cocaine and drug epidemic that plagued the decade. She chose to make an appearance on the hit show Different Strokes, 
about two boys from Harlem taken in by their late mother's Park Avenue employers to send her message. In the episode, one of the boys, Arnold, decides to investigate rumors of drug dealing at his school and write about it for the school paper. Reagan drops by when Arnold's article is published to speak to his school about the dangers of drugs. Here's another one. Newt Gingrich guest starred on Murphy Brown in 1996. CBS promised a throwdown. I'm just going to scroll down. In 1998, John Kerry had a cameo on Cheers. <laughs> never which watched was, it. You never watched it? Yeah, Cheers, no. I watched a few here and there. Uh, let's look at some of these others. Donna Brazil, Democratic strategist Donna Brazil has been on The Good Wife three times. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Does she pay them? Bro, I bet a lot of these they actually do pay to be on there. Yeah, they have. They absolutely have to pay her. Uh, it says she's been on there three times playing herself and doling out political advice. She said, "Oh, look at this." I think people involved in politics make good actors. You don't say. <laughs> well, you wow. heard the old uh, saying, uh, politics is show business for ugly people. Yes. I can't believe she said this out loud. She said, acting and politics both involve fooling people. <laughs> people like being fooled by actors. When you get right down to it, they probably like being fooled by politicians even more. Well, Isn't I mean, she the one who gave the debate questions to Hillary Clinton when Clinton was debating Bernie Sanders so she could mm -hmm. tip it to Hillary? That would be her. She fooled some people. This is so honest. I just, I'm, I can't get over that. Her saying that. Wow. I appreciate the honesty. Thank you, Donna Brazil. <laughs> Uh, Sarah Palin's daughter, Bristol Palin, appeared on a 2010 episode of The Secret Life of the it's American Teenager. No. Oh, who's the one? Stacey Abrams. What was she, she on? She was in Star Trek Discovery. <laughs> to your yeah. chagrin. That was awful. I remember we were watching that thinking... I actually wasn't. I was like surprised, but not surprised. I'm like, of course they would do something like this. Here we go. The thing is, I don't want to see any politicians in like Star Trek, even if I liked them. Man, just keep that out of it. Stacey Abrams explains her Star Trek Discovery season four finale cameo. Abrams, who appeared in the final moments of coming home as the United Earth president said the storylines in Discovery speak to, quote, why we do the work we do in politics. <laughs> okay, look. Look at what she said compared to what Donna Brazil said. That's funny. Donna Brazil was honest. She said, she said, politicians make good actors because we both fool people. Basically, <laughs> that's what she said. And But look what Stacey Abrams says. She wanted to be in it because it's about giving people hope. <laughs> and giving them a better life and creating this vision of what is possible. It's why we do the work we do in politics. <laughs> giving me more food. <laughs> Liar. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, let's see. So uh, let's go down to uh, talk about Saturday Night Live. Okay. Saturday Night Live. And so there have actually been a lot of politicians that guest start on Saturday Night Live. Now, Saturday Night Live, as we talked about in our Saturday Night Live episode, which is one of the first episodes we did on pop culture, which is, I believe it's on Odyssey. No, uh, it might be Odyssey, but I think it's also on Rumble. It's not on YouTube because that got banned. But anybody interested in watching, uh, I believe you can look it up on either one of those platforms. But we did talk about uh, how SNL has had an effect on the perception of politicians. Now, this is something they kind of deny or don't say is as much. But they clearly do, you know, for instance, you know, the infamous uh, Tina Fey impression of Sarah Palin, how Tina Fey said, uh, asked Sarah Palin, said that she could see Russia from her house. A lot of people mm -hmm. thought that Sarah Palin actually said that, but she didn't. It was Tina Fey just saying that part of the skit. And so they do have an effect. I'm not saying that they are a sole cause on the public's perception of various politicians, but... Uh, it does have an effect, and I think recently it's been getting more nasty. Like, 
I do understand that in the very beginning when Chevy Chase was making fun of Gerald Ford, he set he set out to make Gerald Ford look like an idiot, which he admits. But after that, I think the impressions largely weren't as mean spirited as they got, and they were a little bit more even handed. I know SNL always lean left, but compared to today, relative to today, I think they're a little bit more more fair because if you look with what they're doing with Donald Trump, how not only are they misrepresenting certain stuff that he says or just repeating certain things about Trump, like say him being a supposedly being a Russian asset, Russian agent, like people see that and it reinforces their view of him actually being a Russian agent. If they're the type of person who's watching CNN, MSNBC, and, yes. all the late night comedy shows, yes. you know, going up, you know, listening to Hollywood celebrities who are all just repeating this stuff about Trump that wasn't true. Now, some stuff they do about Trump is true. You know, there are certain funny things about him that, you know, um, people should make fun of. That's that's fine. I'm not saying that you can't make fun of holy Trump or anything. No, that's not what I'm saying. But when they are so mean spirit, when they're purposely trying to create an image of him, that's not true. Like I remember we read on that episode about um, Norm MacDonald. Norm MacDonald said that he didn't like Alec Baldwin's impersonation of trump because he thought it was too mean-spirited uh norm believed that in order for someone to do a good impression of someone you had to have some uh level of affinity for that person for the person but with you know baldwin's you uh, you saw that impression and knew that el baldwin hated trump it, it came through the impression just you know how much hatred you know Alec baldwin had for trump and so uh with what they're doing now they're sort of making fun of Biden, but not to the extent that's obvious. Not the same. Because, like, I listen, I will give them credit. I did see one skit where they brought in Jason Sudeikis and uh, some new guy was playing uh, Biden, and Jason Sudeikis comes up and starts sm sniffing himself, the guy playing Biden. So you got that, and, and they did a little bit about him being old, but they obviously didn't go to the degree of him, you know, no. mumbling and turning and shaking the hand of people who aren't there. Uh, number one, number two, they spend so much time making fun of Trump's, you know, sons who are a little, little douchey. I'm being honest, <laughs> but they'll make fun of them, but they won't make fun of Hunter Biden, who has laptops, which is crazy, and smoking crack. And, it's so easy to you know. make fun of Hunter. I know, but if it was Trump's sons who got caught with prostitutes and smoking crack, they would make fun of that every single episode. But they don't do that. Likewise, with um, they'll make fun of Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Bubert for stupid stuff they say, but they won't make fun of AOC for the stupid things she says. Like it's very obviously that they obvious that they know the effect they have on public perception. Oh yeah, well that's why even in that article we read earlier in the episode, the article that was talking about how uh, there was a huge controversy and a, a lot of complaints that they allowed Trump to come on the show. And then the same article mentions, you know, and Hillary went on the show and Bernie went on the show. And it's like they don't view that as being unfair. The fact that they would have they would be so outraged that that he went on there. Why shouldn't he go on there if the other candidates are doing it? Why should you bar him? Because they feel like they know what's what good and evil is and what right and wrong is. And they don't. They're 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 arrogant and ignorant together, which is a dangerous combination. And I have an Inside Edition clip on, on the Trump hosting SNL. We can play in just a bit. The fiery war of words between President Trump and Alec Baldwin, with the president lashing out at 5.42 a.m. It started when Baldwin told The Hollywood Reporter that he doesn't enjoy playing Trump on Saturday Night Live. Every time I do it now, it's like agony, agony. I can't. The media has treated me so unfairly by reporting my entire remarks, even the bad ones. Trump hit back, sending out this angry tweet at 542. Alex Baldwin. Yes, he was saved by his impersonation of me on SNL. Now saying DKT was agony for him. Alex, it was also Alex. Do you see how effortlessly funny he is? He just hit Alex in there twice. Not once, twice, twice. So you know that it's on purpose. You were terrible. Bring back Daryl Hammond, much funnier and a far greater talent. Former cast member Daryl Hammond also played Trump on SNL. 
What a great, great night. Baldwin fired Daryl Hammond was a good string of tweets. Clinton and Trump. Agony though it may be, I'd like to hang in there for the impeachment hearings, the resignation speech, the farewell helicopter ride to Mar-a-Lago, you know, the good stuff. And this, Mr. President, please ask your wife to stop calling me for SNL tickets. Hey, Melania, we've got Charles Barkley this Saturday. Trump didn't respond. He and the First Lady left D.C. today to attend Reverend Billy Graham's funeral in Charlotte. I think uh, I remember listening to Daryl Hammond on, I think it was Adam Carolla's show. And Daryl Hammond talked about how uh, he was getting ready to have a lot of gigs in 2016 as, you know, Trump's campaign was going. And once he won, you know, Alec Ball, or uh, Daryl Hammond thought he was going to, you know, be do- touring tours and be invited on these shows to do impressions as Trump. But he says his view was that when Alec Baldwin did his Trump impression, that nobody was interested in him anymore <laughs> doing his Trump Because the left just so. love Alec Baldwin. Mm-hmm. Well, they I mean, love they him still. Love they him. still love him. He's got some, I think they do. Got some issues going on. But. They do have issues. Um, mm-hmm. Kevin Anderson says, but Trump haters won't think it's on purpose. They'll think Trump's an idiot. I just wanted to highlight this because this is the brilliant, this is one of the brilliant things about his comedy is that it doesn't matter if he misspells Alex's name on purpose or not. That's what's funny about it. Because if he's not misspelling it on purpose, if he really doesn't know how to spell his name, what a burn that he doesn't care about you enough to know your real name. That's freaking hilarious. And if he's doing it on purpose to pretend like he doesn't know how to spell your name, then that's also funny that he did it twice. Like, they don't get it. It's 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 such a... Um, he's an amazing he's an expert troll mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. any leftist watching this is like oh he's so dumb he doesn't even know how to spell alec it's, god you, you're not you're missing out on so much humor <laughs> like <laughs> you're playing checkers <laughs> i do think the guy they currently have doing trump's actually does much better impersonation of trump than alec baldwin they kind of saturday Night live kind of luck, lucked into him because if they didn't have him forgive the guy's name then they would have had someone doing a really bad impersonation of trump and the guy does pretty good biden i must say if i'm being fair so uh, you know this- just play a little bit of this i just want to give a sample of jim carrey and he was simultaneously praised and hated by some people who were supporters of biden for its impersonation even though it's not really bad in terms of like not really going after biden that much Wait, what was the song? SNL. Oh. I'm just, just play so a few excited seconds to bit. talk to America with real life Americans. Hey, George, check it out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, pause it. I just want to play too much of it since SNL. But see, that the, the thing I didn't like about this, particularly this year, was that Biden's not like this. Like, what are you exaggerating? Because typically in impersonations, you're exaggerating some aspect of them that is kind of true, but you're doing it to a way that's kind of comedic. And then that is like, he's not spry like that. He's not somebody who's going, look what I can do type. He's someone who's just kind of very out of it, quite frankly. And again, they're not, they're not doing what everybody can see you know it's the same thing with kamala harris they have maya rudolph who i love maya rudolph she's pretty funny but they portray you know um kamala harris as being like cool and in charge and sassy and like that's not her she's this, she's a mess <laughs> she, she's, Gross. Like you're missing she's, shots you could take yeah she's somebody who chooses to be black or indian depending on what audience she's in front of she's a political chameleon who will just say whatever to to get gain support in the moment yeah i've got an snl clip for you and be careful it's snl that's nbc well this one is uh dan Aykroyd playing president carter and the mm-hmm. reason why it's funny, it's a classic clip. The reason why I think it's so funny is it reminds me of the Ike ads that we watched earlier in the episode where he talks to regular Americans. And so this was the thing that President Carter would do of taking calls and talking to regular Americans. And so Dan Aykroyd is spoofing it. And it's, I'm trying to see which here. 
where should we play it? Have you seen this? No. Midnight. Hello, Dr. Midnight. Is Rosalind there? I really like her. Wait, hold on. Don't play too much. I'll play just a little bit more. There's so this guy calls in and basically is having a bad trip. Peter, what did the acid look like? Um, they were these little orange pills. Were they barrel shaped? Uh, yes. Okay, right. You did some orange sunshine, Peter. <laughs> I have seen this. Yeah. You have? Yeah. Maybe I said it to you. I just like it. Just he knows so much about acid, and he's like asking him which pills did you take, and then he's telling him what to do, and you're gonna have this trip, and this was gonna happen to you. And he's just like the, and it's not so much making fun of Carter. Like it's not like the anti the, the stuff we know that's making fun of Trump, where as you mentioned, you can feel the visceral hatred that Alec Baldwin has for Trump. There's no visceral hatred here coming from Dan Aykroyd. It's just a funny sketch with a, that happens to have the president in it, and it's it's not like this, um, you know, it, it's not a, it's not coming from a hateful place. It's coming from no, a joyful you know, place. The joke is that you know because he's such a you know good shy kind of christian guy but yet he knows about this you know acid and <laughs> vices and stuff that's the whole joke it's similar to yes. the, the uh joke they did when um phil hartman played ronald reagan and ronald reagan's just you know it's kind of nice guy. He's like ah, how are you doing little girl and then after the little girl leaves he's like good let's go guys and he's like this mastermind he pulls out these maps it's like <laughs> and, and that's a joke that you wouldn't you wouldn't expect him to have I mean, right. Joke. It's just a funny bit of playful fun. Yes. Um, thank you for the super chat. Mark, for $10, thank you so much, says, in 1846, Kierkegaard observed newspapers becoming tyrannical as they reached huge numbers anonymously with trivial information and hyperbolic truth taken with equal authority and importance and easily swayed mass opinion. Well, isn't that the comment of the night? That's exactly what uh, Mr. Chris is saying that book is about, amusing ourselves to death. Thank you so much, Mark. Okay, where should we go now? We And we have about 15 minutes. Um, let's pull up, okay, I'll pull up a couple of things. Um, pull up that article, real quick about audiences thinking SNL is too political. This one article, I believe, is from 2019, so little, little ways away, but still, uh, I think it, it's apt to what people are still feeling, and probably even more so today. This is from The Hollywood Reporter. Their headline is, Many Americans Say Saturday Night Live is Now Too Political, Poll Finds. Of the politicians that Americans most want to see guest on the series, Barack Obama topped the list, followed by Donald Trump. During NBC's Saturday Night Live uh, premiere on September 29th, Matt Damon led a 13-minute cold open as Brett Kavanaugh. Oh, I saw this. This was actually, this was not funny. This was disgusting. I saw this. They made fun of this man uh, and, and the very real emotion he was expressing over his daughter's, like, the way she was affected by all of these allegations coming out about him and, and her forgiveness and grace and love for the people that were attacking him. If you haven't seen his testimony, go and watch it. Uh, it's not uh, what we see from a lot of politicians, which is this fake tears, like Amber Heard kind of tears where you don't actually see the tears or where they're, they're um, mimicking it. It wasn't that. It was a man fighting back actual tears, and it was very moving. I'm sorry for my side note here. I just I thought this was one of the most disgusting things I'd ever seen on Siren Live. Um, so they're talking about that. Matt Damon led a 13-minute cold open as Brett Kavanaugh portraying the then embattled justice as blustery and weepy days before he was confirmed by the Senate to top court in a contentious vote. The episode, which also featured a pro-Trump speech by Kanye West, nabbed 6.96 million total viewers, a high for the show's season so far. The 44th season of SNL's usual frequently lampoons Beltway topics. This season included Ben Stiller's March 2nd recreation of Trump fixer Michael Cohen's Senate testimony, Alec Baldwin's February 16th version of Trump's border wall plea, and a February 9th send-up of Virginia Governor Ralph Northam's blackface controversy. But there's a large minority of Americans who view the show as too political, a new Hollywood Reporter poll finds. Among respondents, 39% 
agreed with the sentiment that the series has gotten too political, while 30% disagree. So a larger percentage agree. Broken down by party affiliation, 60% of Democrats polled in the survey said that they don't mind the political leaning of SNL. Of course they don't. <laughs> you losers. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, 52% of Republicans dislike the slant of the series when it delves into politics. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, more Americans view Silent Live as left-leaning show than politically neutral. Duh. About 48% said the series is more liberal politically, while only 5% describe the show as more conservative. And 10% Said SNL has no political link. What? <laughs> okay. But yeah. But yeah, SNL has kind of like the Daily Show become a source of news. <laughs> yeah. Particularly the weekend update, because you know, a lot of people actually do take I know it's jokes and people are laughing, and on some level they know it's jokes, but still, like I said earlier, it, it reinforces a lot of falsehoods that are already floating around in people's minds because what they've consumed from the rest of the media or even if they're not watching like new actual news media they are watching john oliver and daily yeah. show yeah and late night comedy Kendall. shows yeah Who's and there, a lot of people are being informed sadly by comedians and actors speaking of actors yeah this was uh Embarrassing for black people. All, all it takes uh, to get uh, on black people's side is for you to start singing like you're some Southern Baptist, you know, preacher or choir. Is that, like, is that why you included this? Yeah. Amazing grace. Mm hmm. Mm. Amazing grace. He's doing the preacher, the preacher. Yes. AOC does the preacher too, but she's pretty bad at it. Amazing. Oh God. <laughs> grace. How sweet the sound that no more, no more, no more, no more. <laughs> Amazing grace. That's all it takes. Uh, I did have one more video, and then we can move on because we. No, no. <laughs> one more video, and then we can move on to funny stuff and and close out the show. Um, if you could go down to the let's see where was it, the CNN hologram. So I don't know if you remember this. Uh, I think this is two thousand eight. So I, I think. <laughs> This is the height of ridiculousness from the 24-hour news network networks in terms of the way they present the information, not necessarily the information they're giving. But they decided to have Wolf Blitzer uh, correspond with one of their news anchors, who's for some reason a hologram. I mean, could have just been talking to a you know television screen, but no, they decided to have a, a hologram and make it seem like he's Luke Skywalker communicating with Obi Wan Kenobi. It's yeah, so embarrassing. They only did this like once. Well, there are massive crowds gathered outside here, as you just saw. Uh, 65,000 ticketed people are going to be let in. But Hi. as many as a million are expected to be outside <laughs> oh, surrounding no. uh, this Grant Park location. And you got to keep people entertained. Uh, where yeah. they are. Use. Why not have uh, so Barack Obama is at the Hyatt <laughs> Hotel nearby where he's going to eventually be watching uh, election returns as well. He played basketball earlier in the day, which has become, you know, an election day tradition for him. Uh, and we're expecting him to go home at some point, change, uh, and then watch his election return uh, in a ring around me. I'm in the center. And they. I would think this was a parody if I didn't know that it, that you're telling me that it's real. Yep. It's ridiculous. I agree too. I, I can't believe it. it actually happened, but it did. And I feel like someday they'll bring that back. I've got, I've, are we going to do funny stuff now? Yeah. I was thinking about closing. closing out this, this isn't meant to be funny, but it's funny. I was looking for a compilation of politicians dancing. I'll just play a little bit at the beginning of this one. What you're about to see in this video may be disturbing to some viewers. <laughs> <laughs> but in all honesty, the politicians dancing in these videos uh. 
may not know what they're doing is offensive. Like British Prime Minister Theresa May, who probably won't take home the title of Dancing Queen anytime soon. Oh, man. 62-year-old is known for her dance moves. Okay. Okay. <laughs> They're all so bad. I've what got... Is... Go ahead. Uh, I just want to see some politician who could actually dance and just wonder if that would cause their poll ratings <laughs> or approval ratings to jump. <laughs> if you had some politician yeah. came out and just like, it's yeah. like an awesome dancer. So they're like, whoa. They'd be on all, they'd be on like the equivalent of Arsenio Hall tap dancing. Mm -hmm. Like, like Bill Clinton with his saxophone. Okay. This is one other comedy thing I want to show you. This is an old, you may have seen this guy's, this was done by Remy. He's a comedian. It's really funny. And I brought it up because of the Daisy ad, which was basically, if you don't vote for me, people are going to die. And if you don't, if you don't vote for this thing that I want, or if you don't vote for me, people will die has become so common that, uh, that reason magazine, Remy at reason magazine, put this out. We'll just watch a little bit of it. These cuts are blood money. People will die. Let's be very clear. Senate Republicans are paying for tax cuts for the wealthy with American lives. People need kidneys. It's sad but decreed. Yet the senator's hoarding one more than she needs. I offer this bill and I hope you'll vote aye. Unless, of course, you just want people to die. <laughs> Traffic deaths have many crying with fear. Over 30,000 people are dying each year. This modest change, I propose, must be applied. Unless, of course, you just want people, people to die. die. Alcohol deaths are exceeding comparisons. Black people, white people, Native Americans. We need to ban alcohol. <laughs> It can't be denied unless, of course, you just want people to die. Okay. You can watch the whole thing. It's more of the same. It's really funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What do you got uh, for me? Uh, pull up the Nixon versus JFK uh, Simpsons. Uh, the Nixon versus JFK? Yeah. You guys, if you're new to our Wednesday night pop culture shows, this is a show that Mr. Chris and I do every Wednesday at 8 o'clock Central. And we delve into different subjects in pop culture and try and figure out how they've influenced culture at large or have been influenced by culture at large. Anyway, at the end of the show, we do a, fun, a bit of funny things. So here we go. All of our Duff commercials, but... Here's a very special one from 1960. Well, I would suggest, uh, Mr. Van Oker, that uh, if you knew the president, uh, that that was probably just a facetious remark. And now a word from our sponsor. I would like to take this opportunity to uh, express my <laughs> fondness for uh, Duff Beer. <laughs> I'd uh, also like to express my fondness for that particular beer. <laughs> <laughs> like a duff in his life. <laughs> that so that gets at the heart of <laughs> you know that whole thing about in fact we had we had so much queued up for this but there were some articles we had queued up we don't have time for but about you know how it started to be about you know, what president would you like to have a beer with and that's how people are voting mm -hmm. this whole likability thing yeah ridiculous um yeah bring up just play a little bit this is a living color one you know we, we of love course living color uh, this is Jim Carrey as Bill Clinton. Living color. You don't have to play the whole thing, of course, just a little bit. This is the right one, right? Yep. Bush lied about no new taxes. He lied about being the education president. And he's proven that we can't believe anything he says. Yes, but haven't you told a few lies yourself? I mean, how can we believe anything you say? And how do we know you're still not messing around with your wife? Good point. <laughs> Let me say this about that. <laughs> I need to. I thought he would bring out a saxophone. <laughs> <laughs> this is better. <laughs> Like playing careless whisper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh, this is good. You want me to keep going? Oh, just a little bit more. Okay, okay. <laughs> and you claim that I am not qualified because I worked that booty for hours. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a draft doctor. No, not like that for quail. No, don't believe the thing that they say. I'm not an adulterer. And I'm not an adulterer. <laughs> so vote for me on election day. Get up on my floor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because that's just one way to get to that quarters. Uh, great. Oh, man. Should we do tattoos? Let's go to tattoos. So when we have time, we close out the show with, uh, we play this game called Is There a Tattoo of That? Where we look to see if any of the subjects we've discussed tonight uh, if people have tattooed those things on themselves and you would be surprised if you're new here to find that yes people have tattooed lots of crazy things on themselves probably the craziest is uh who's that comedian at snl pete pete davidson has a hillary tattoo pete davidson has a hillary clinton tattoo it's pretty terrible okay look at these george w bush why there's one on a foot some of them are <laughs> just what is the point oh there's one of the guy from full house bob saget's in there for some reason it's weird but okay it's so creepy i don't understand it's yeah, like in the if foot you, one too <laughs> they're all weird i don't care if you love george bush or you hate, <laughs> or you hate george bush i'm in i'm in the hate camp Either way, why would you want him on your body? <laughs> Interesting, that middle one of him being a vampire to the Statue of Liberty. Yeah, it's just crazy, though. It's like, I kind of like that as a as a political cartoon in a magazine, mm -hmm. but it's like, I'm going to put that on your body forever? Why? I don't know. I don't get the political ones. I don't. Oh, no, this next category... You want to tell people what the next one is? Uh, this one is uh, Barry Sotaro, uh, Barack Obama. Of course, people have Obama tattoos. There's one of him and Michelle. Curious how it breaks down by race. Like, are there more black people with Obama tattoos or white people? I bet there's, well, a lot of these look like black people, but I bet there's a lot of white people with Obama tattoos. Like that guy. Like this white guy down here? Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Well, yeah, people have gotten it. I think, I feel like we've looked at this last one before, but... Probably. We should have a refresher. <laughs> this one's Trump. all over the place. Yep. Trump tattoos, of course. Like, of course, people got Trump too. Just, just like, of course, they got Obama. And again, it's like, like the others. There's people who clearly love him and people who clearly hate him. Like this one where he's a, a devil. I don't get it. Either way, if you love him or hate him, why are you putting him on your body? Look at that one with the hair. <laughs> so weird. It is like clearly that one of him, that unflattering one. Definitely someone who hates him. Couldn't <laughs> imagine someone who likes him would actually get him doing that because that's the an typical angry photo they always use in articles. Yeah. Then Trump attacks. Like even if he's just lightly making fun of something, it's always attack. It's violent verbiage. There's Trump with poop. Why are you getting someone you hate tattooed on you with poop also? Why do you want poop tattooed on you? <laughs> <laughs> Let people know to stay away from you because you're crazy. I mean, if if I were not married and I went on a date with someone and they had a tattoo, tattoos are not a deal breaker for me, not at all. But I would probably say any tattoo of any politician, good or bad, is a deal breaker. <laughs> yeah. That's a what? 
Right, because it's a red flag. Something's wrong with you. <laughs> Don't you think? <laughs> yep. I, I, I agree because some of that stuff is just like, why the hell would anybody put this on the body and expect people to like <laughs> give you high fives and people who want to date you? I mean, that's just an immediate warning sign to normal people. Uh, weird. Okay. Um, well, thank you guys. Thank you guys for hanging out with us tonight for another live uh, pop culture. We do these every Wednesday, 8 o'clock Central, and we do deep dives into different topics. If you have a topic you would like for us to cover, please leave a comment. It helps our algorithm. If you want to help support the channel, you can do that by leaving a comment, letting us know what you like or what you would like for us to talk about. And um, I appreciate hanging out with you guys tonight. Alan Scott was asking if I'm in a cave. This is a <laughs> dark up here. This is our upstairs because we're currently renovating my studio. So uh, it's, it's pretty dark up here, isn't it? And uh, let's see. Kandra says, Carrie and Mystery Chris are great, and the chat is hysterical. Well, well thank you. You guys are pretty funny. I can't look at the chat too closely or, or I'll get distracted. Yeah, <laughs> lose my train of thought. Yeah. Bungalow Logic says, happy I was here for this one. Yeah, this one was fun. I love when you throw in these old news clips. It's so interesting. Yeah, it's always fun to look back at that kind of stuff. It is. Well, thank you guys for tuning in. Again, Friday at 1 o'clock is going to be an interview I did with Rebel Educator. If you're a parent, if you have uh, friends who are parents and who might be interested, definitely tune in this Friday at 1 o'clock. And we're going to talk about all the different alternative methods of educating other than the public school system. So um, we'll see you guys then. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chris. Thank you. It was fun. Thanks, chat. Good night. Bye.